Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. And I'm here too. My hiatus is officially over, and I'm keeping my avatar. <coughs> yeah, turns out you guys like him quite a bit, and I severely overestimated the disapproval of it. Anyway. So Julian Assange, founder of WikiLeaks, has been arrested by London police. He was evicted from the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he was staying in, to avoid extradition to Sweden and the United States. Currently, he is being indicted by the U.S. government. The U.K. is trying to get him extradited to the U.S., where he faces five years in prison for breaking zero laws. According to the U.S. government, Assange broke no law. You'll see what I mean shortly. But first, some context. What's going on? Assange has been working with many other journalists and government insiders leaking data through the nonprofit news outlet known as WikiLeaks since 2006, exposing government backed and established financial cartels, war crimes, extrajudicial killings, torture in prisons not known about publicly, various forms of political manipulation such as fixing elections and NGO Five Eyes organized coups, surveillance, and and other atrocities committed by governments around the world, this naturally made Assange, along with WikiLeaks as an organization, a massive thorn in the side of the political elite. So unsurprisingly, being that literally all governments do is murder people and try and stop them from obtaining financial opportunities, it didn't take very long before anyone known to be associated with WikiLeaks began being targeted by many of the world's governments. Assange sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy to avoid extradition to Sweden. Ecuador and Sweden don't have an extradition treaty, so he couldn't legally be deported there to stand trial. Trial on charges of sexual assault and rape made against him on August 2010. And that charge was eventually dropped on May 19th of 2017 after seven years of the Swedish government attempting to do everything it could to detain Assange, even going as far as trying to appeal to the United Nations to take coercive action against the UK, to which the United Nations replied that the UK and Sweden were attempting to detain Julian Assange arbitrarily on February 5th of 2016. So... That backfired. And for the record, the original arrest warrant issued by the Swedish government was for a sexual assault allegation from two women, to which there has never been any evidence presented to this day that Julian Assange was ever even in the same room with either of them. We can argue whether or not he did do it, or if the Swedish government manufactured the charges all we want. It's not important to the discussion. What is important is that Sweden and the U.S. do have an extradition treaty. They've had one since 1961, and if Assange stands trial in Sweden, you bet your ass he's going to be extradited to the U.S. on some form of espionage charge. Sweden is also legally required to extradite people to commit bigamy, apparently. The 60s were strange times. Anyways, following Assange failing to appeal his extradition to Sweden, Ecuador grants asylum to him on August 16th, 2012. He is forced to stay indoors at all times because London police threatened to arrest him instantly should he step foot outside. Of course, London police keep the embassy under 24-7 surveillance for three years, ending on October 2015 at a cost of an estimated 17 million in US dollars. So Ecuador was willing to give Assange asylum, even granting him citizenship. So what changed? In 2017, the new president of Ecuador, Lenin Moreno, was elected into office, succeeding Rafael Correa, the president who originally granted Assange asylum. I am probably mispronouncing those names, I apologize. But April 6, 2017, signaled a very strong regime change in terms of how the Ecuadorian government will treat Assange, telling him that one of the conditions for his asylum is for him to not interfere in politics. Moreno, clearly a more Assange-hostile president than before. Well, so what? Well, the U.S. has a telling history regarding Korea. Put simply, they don't like him. In fact, They've worked to have him removed from office, in the name of democracy, of course. Indeed. 
As most people are aware by now, the U.S. government has a long history of manipulating the government structure of other nations, primarily to stop politicians from being put in charge of the said nations, which attempts to create economic policy that contradicts the U.S. government's interests or would otherwise undermine one of the various international cartels the U.S. government either requires to exist or greatly benefits from, such as OPEC the IMF, or the World Bank. And if you weren't already aware of this, well, here's the former CIA director, James Woolsey, admitting to this on national television. Have we ever tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably. But uh, it was for the good of the system in order to avoid the communists from taking no. over. We don't do that CIA. now, though. We don't mess around other people's well, elections, Joe. Mm, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> o- only for a very good Can cause. Can you do that, too? Anyway, in 2006, a paper regarding the Ecuadorian election of the same year was leaked by WikiLeaks entitled Ecuador Election, What's at Stake, in which the U.S. ambassador to Ecuador, Linda Jewell, stated, quote, While none of the candidates will return the bilateral relationship to the halcyon days when then-president-elect Lucio Gutierrez declared himself our strongest ally in Latin America, none of the top contenders would affect USG interests as thoroughly as Rafael Carrera. The document went on to detail a specific interest in ensuring that the candidate Rafael Carrera was not elected to be the president of Ecuador, and detailing how the U.S. government would go about trying to stop him from being elected by forming local front groups pretending to be grassroots political organizations, which were, of course, really made up of government employees, either from or recruited by the U.S. Embassy to Ecuador, to spy on Carrera and his campaign, and also to spread propaganda for his opposition's campaigns, to which the U.S. government spent a total of $884,000 in the period. The U.S. government also funded the NGO group, the National Endowment for Democracy, over $1 million in the exact same time frame. Close to the end of the 2006 election, these papers began to leak out and be publicized through WikiLeaks. And in response to concerns over the threat of widespread backlash because, well, they overtly interfered in another nation's elections, Linda Jewell again stated this. Beyond supporting a clean electoral process, we have few levers to influence Ecuadorian voters. Ecuador's media elite is hypersensitive to perceived internal meddling, so overt attempts to influence voter decisions is fraught with risk. Privately, however, we have warned our political, economic, and media contacts of the threat Carrera represents in Ecuador's future. And despite everything, Carrera was elected. Following his election, the U.S. Embassy in Ecuador bribed local police forces with bonuses and equipment, often making them their eyes and ears on the Coria administration. When the government started to learn the police was taking bribes, the government took steps to forbid their agents from having unofficial ties with the U.S. Embassy. The U.S. didn't like that and demagogued to the police, whom they had already forged a relationship with. The police were told the Ecuadorian government was stopping them from receiving bonuses completely. This wasn't true, obviously, but that's the justification that they went with instigating the 2009-2010 attempted coups. Coria has also claimed the U.S. government instigated nationwide protests to undermine his government in 2015. Given their historical pattern of using NGOs and aid groups like USAID and the Peace Corps as a cover for regime change, this is hardly unprecedented. Either way, U.S. meddling in Ecuadorian politics has a long and horrifying history. But what does this have to do with WikiLeaks, you might be asking? Well, on June 28th of 2018, Vice President Mike Pence talked with President Moreno about Assange. The two agreed to discuss the topic further, and eight months later, the World Bank and the IMF, which are government-established international cartels headquartered out of Washington, D.C., granted Ecuador's government $10.6 billion in, quote-unquote, rescue funds.
It's worth noting that these groups, along with many others, have been long documented using coercion to manipulate the international markets to strong-arm certain nations, mainly by threatening banks, charities, and other heavily influential organizations located within the countries in question with force if they don't artificially limit the availability and terms of loans, grants, or other financial assistance to these countries because they're engaging and economic activity which runs in conflict with the U.S. government's interests. Literally, these organizations are just government-backed cartels. Remember that program created by the U.S. Department of Justice known as Operation Choke Point, which my video exposing the real reason payment processors are targeting alt tech was about? If not, it's a program created by the DOJ, which was used by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to force payment processors to disassociate with certain producers or entire industries the U.S. government deemed to be politically inexpedient by arbitrarily deeming them to be high-risk clients, which would mean that their credit ratings would plummet and banks, along with payment processors, consequently would be forced forced to disassociate with these producers or else they would run the risk of being in violation of finance laws. The IMF, the World Bank, OECD, or any of these other cartels are effectively just operation choke point but on an international scale. The reason this is relevant is because while I'm not suggesting that Ecuador's politicians are somehow better than US politicians or are even above being bribed, in fact being a politician of any kind necessarily makes one more susceptible to bribery since there's no disincentive from accepting a bribe because the state is a coercive monopoly on every service it provides, whereas with any non-state firm, there's a competitive standard in quality of service and price. But the IMF or the World Bank, like any other firm, do not just hand out loans for absolutely no reason. So if one of these cartels is offering a loan to a different state, it is effectively a threat based on the organizations which the IMF and the World Bank are a front for are known to do if the government in question were to refuse, especially considering that the U.S. had only months previously been putting significant pressure on Ecuador. So, unsurprisingly, less than two months following the $10.6 billion grant to the Ecuadorian government from the IMF and the World Bank, President Moreno said this. Today, I announced that Mr. Julian Assange's disastrous and aggressive behavior, the hostile and threatening statements of his allied organization against Ecuador, and especially the violation of international treaties, have brought the situation to a point where it, Assange's asylum, is unsustainable and no longer viable. Assange's asylum status was revoked by the Ecuadorian government following a blatant act of legal blackmail. The globalist World Banks gave the Ecuadorian money in exchange for Assange. The U.S. government had been seeking control over Ecuador for years, if only to remove one of Venezuela's and Russia's allies in the Western Hemisphere. Once the U.S. finally got their guy into power, one that was more receptive to foreign bankers, all that was needed was for Ecuador to complete their end of the bargain. Which is where we were, Thursday, April 11th, 2019. Assange was kicked out of the embassy, where he was immediately apprehended by a British goon squad. Ostensibly, the British police were originally interested in arresting him for reneging on his agreement for his bail in 2012. But rather than stand trial for that, he is facing immediate extradition to the United States, where he is indicted on charges of conspiracy to hack a computer, with Chelsea Manning. A decision that was made before there was even a public statement from British police. Now the indictment against Assange is a joke. The case against him hinges on one crucial piece of evidence, and that what was being taken was classified information. How information is determined as being classified hinges on Executive Order 13526, being passed in 2009 by President Obama. Merely the latest of executive orders since 1951 that defines what kind of government documents are classified and at what level. There is just one problem. How can he do this? 
classification isn't a power granted to the executive branch under the U.S. Constitution, and if such rules were passed by Congress, then it wouldn't be an executive order, would it? Plus, nowhere in the executive order is any law passed by Congress referenced that authorizes him to do this either. Maybe there's a law I don't know of where he is. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I know for a fact that the classification of information is not a power granted to the president under the Constitution. With this in mind, the law that Assange is accused of violating requires definitions external to the lawful legislative process to define its terms. It's no different than if there was a tax on sandwiches, and then some guy named Todd tried to define a sandwich using what he wrote on a napkin. It's ridiculous. Nothing that could even generously be called law can rely on such arbitrary standards. Therefore, we must necessarily accept all definitions of classified data as invalid, and since no legal claim within the boundaries of U.S. law can be made as to how classified data is defined, we must default to assuming that nothing is classified. Ultimately, the state has no case to claim that Assange or Chelsea Manning did anything wrong, which is why they claim conspiracy to hack a computer. They have no case no evidence, at least none that has been presented, save three lines in a chat log conversation. After this upload, that's all I really have got left. Curious eyes never run dry in my experience. After this discussion, I decided to download the data. Manning has confirmed his own words, but all they have are allegations that the user Ox, or Press Association, might be Assange. For this reason, Despite receiving a pardon from President Obama in 2016, he is being held. So the government can compel Manning to testify against Assange, and ultimately against himself as a WikiLeaks data dropper, in a flagrant violation of Manning's constitutional rights, both the Fifth Amendment to prevent people from being compelled to be a witness against themselves, and the First Amendment, free speech being applied to freedom against compelled speech, all to prosecute a man who, by their own legal code, broke no laws. The state has no legitimate claim to having been wronged. Under what psychotic system of banana republic authoritarianism can this even be generously called justice? The U.S. government has also claimed Assange committed treason, but he's not even from the United States and doesn't have a United States citizenship. They need to do all they, that should be done. I mean, this was an, an act of treason. At risk is either something that should require prosecution for treason, and at the very least, it's a treasonous, hostile act. Well, look, I, I agree with the analysis of the morality of this act of both my colleagues here. To compare this to the pe Pentagon Papers is, to me, Inaccurate and indeed blasphemous. 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 So that doesn't make sense any way you look at it. The government seriously doesn't even know which user they're claiming Assange is, let alone have any evidence that Assange is actually guilty of anything they're accusing him of, or that anything they're accusing him of is actually a crime for that matter. And of course they know this, which is why in describing what Assange did, the media along with politicians are using terms such as engaging in hacker tactics to describe Assange and Manning's supposed covert communications because they have no basis to claim that Assange or Manning hacked into any government computers, and of course they have no evidence that he was talking to Manning before Manning leaked the information. And when that failed, the politicians along with the media started making outrageous character assassinations, ranging from Assange skateboarding in the halls of the Ecuadorian embassy, all the way to Assange smearing shit all over the walls. The coverage across all mainstream and second stream media outlets is very clearly a propaganda effort on behalf of the governments involved to assassinate Julian Assange's character and to implant the idea that Assange is a criminal, even when according to their own laws he isn't. 
Which, by the way, how fucking badly do you have to mess up as the creator of a state propaganda narrative to try and demonstrably lie about someone in order to convince the population that they're a criminal and for this demonstrably incorrect narrative to be based on something which even the government doesn't consider to be a crime? The fucking US government made the exact same mistake last year when they went after Cody Wilson and accused him of having sex with a 7 17 year old girl in the state of Texas, which the age of consent in is 17. Then the media frantically scrambled to try and claim that the girl was 16 or 15, but the publicly available arrest warrant said that she was 17. So the damage was done. I have a full video going over that nonsense for anyone who's curious. But, I mean, good lord, imagine being so stupid and incompetent that you try and frame people for crimes they didn't commit without what they're being accused of actually being recognized by your own fucking government as a crime. Oh my god, the state can't even do psyops correctly, and that's like one of the only things politicians can do other than steal from and kill people. Speaking of psyops, remember how important Julian Assange and WikiLeaks were in the 2016 presidential campaign after WikiLeaks published 30,000 emails of internal communications from politicians within the Democratic Party? How much Donald Trump praised WikiLeaks and Julian Assange? We've learned so much from WikiLeaks. Oh, we love WikiLeaks. Boy, they have really WikiLeaks. 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 I mean, this WikiLeaks is fascinating. The WikiLeaks revelations. This WikiLeaks is like a treasure trove. WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks, right? How much second stream media outlets controlled by the state through Operation Mockingbird and COINTELPRO like Fox News and Breitbart praised WikiLeaks and Assange for their brave and damning reporting? Yeah, well, now all the fake opposition are exposing themselves for the frauds that they are, such as Ben Shapiro's pitifully cringy segment covering this, wherein one of the most prolific ass polls of 2019 so far, he attempts to accuse Julian Assange of being an agent of the Russian government. In London, now, the reality is that he had been a tool of the Russians for a very long time, according to the best intelligence sources. Just completely obliterating the idea that these mainstream conservative outlets and commentators have motivations which deviate from CNN or MSNBC even fucking slightly. Not like any of their other narratives are any better. Of course, they tried the classic and timeless PUBLISHING THIS INFORMATION PUT PEOPLE'S LIVES IN DANGER, which, frankly, I'm surprised that media hacks are even able to say this with a straight face anymore in the age of social media. Whose lives are in danger? What part of what was published specifically endangered them? What do you mean by their lives are endangered? What's endangering their lives? How is what Wiki leaks released any different from documents which were published by the government themselves, such as the Pentagon Papers. Blasphemous. Basic questioning can reveal that this line of argumentation is not actually an argument, but is instead just blatantly unintelligent and low-quality propaganda designed to uncritically provoke an emotional response out of the viewer. Remember how much Trump loved WikiLeaks? Yeah, now he's lying and claiming he doesn't know anything about WikiLeaks. Do you still love WikiLeaks? Uh, I know nothing about WikiLeaks. It's not my thing. Which is arguably worse than if you were to just openly criticize Julian Assange and admit that he's in support of his imprisonment. Because at least if he were to give a straight answer, people wouldn't be trying to twist their minds into mental pretzels to both justify being a Trump supporter and somehow thinking that they're opposition to a political elite, or trying to make heads or tails of what's going to happen next. I still can't get over that the United States paid $10.6 billion for one guy. Aren't we $22 trillion in debt? Jeez. The only relatively good aspect about Assange being extradited to the United States is that it should completely shatter the delusion that Trump, or any politician for that matter, could possibly be opposition to the state. The notion that there's a separation between the motivations of certain groups within the government based upon ideological grounds, along with the idea that documented Operation Mockingbird assets like Fox News or Breitbart are opposed to political rulers and corruption.
Just like any other politicians, government-funded or established organizations, along with mainstream media outlets, when push comes to shove, they will fuck you over if you oppose the state's interests just as quickly as the one second stream figures like Ben Shapiro, Tucker Carlson, or Donald Trump tell you that they're against. And from the looks of things, that's exactly what some people within the alternative media who have previously been snared into this insidious deceit are starting to realize, and hopefully more start putting the pieces together as this story unravels, and pretend anti-establishment types continue to reveal their true colors. Anyways, this should serve as a wake-up call for anyone even sympathetic to liberty. The U.S. will break its own laws and weaponize its legal system against anyone that is genuinely a threat to their interest. Like blood-crazed savages, their priests of statism bray with joy that someone who was exposing them for who they really are is in their custody. I understand they intervene on our behalf, so we're going to extradite him and it's good to get him back. It'll be really good to get him back on United States soil. So that their property is being returned to them. So now he's our property to we can get the facts and the truth from him. And that They'll put on a Soviet-style show trial and make an example out of Assange to terrorize people out of committing actual journalism. For what exactly? What has he done that was so horrible that the United States had to declare him his public enemy number one? He revealed the truth about the government using their own words. Our government's own actions are vindicating everything we've been saying for over a year. In clown world, telling the truth is an act of rebellion. If so, then what we need are more rebels. Questions, comments, critique? What do you think of the U.S. government's indictment of Julian Assange? Do you think he'll go to jail or die tragically by shooting himself in the back of the head in a weightlifting accident? Leave a comment below. Go check out Esso the Freeze channel if you haven't already. Link in the description. Or if you're watching this on his channel, oh hi, I'm Filthy Heretic. My channel will be in the description as well. Thanks for watching. Like, share, and subscribe right now.